Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. Okay, now, what is Gilead? You, we're going to hear a lot about Gilead. Remember in episode 14, we talked about Jacob and Laban. When Jacob left Haran with his two wives and their father Laban chased him because he left without saying anything and they caught up to him and they made a covenant together and they made a heap of stones and he called that place Gilead uh, which means heap of a testimony. So that's where the name started. With Gilead. Um, but then there was a mountain where that happened, and that mountain became Mount Gilead. The Gileadites were a family within the tribe of Manasseh. They possessed Mount Gilead. Mount Gilead has two parts. This is a picture of Mount Gilead that we used in episode 2. Looking across Lake Galilee, the mountain in the center is the land of Bashan, which became the land of Manasseh, on their half of Mount Gilead. And the mountain on the right of that is the other half of Mount Gilead, which is the land of Gad. The Gileadites possess the southern part of the land of Manasseh, on the, 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 the right side of the center mountain. So that is Gilead. Moving on in Judges chapter 10, moving on from the fall of Ambalek, a man from the tribe of Naphtali ruled for 23 years from a town near Shechem. A man named Jer ruled from Gilead for 22 years, and after he died, the children of Israel worshipped Baalim and Ashtaroth and the gods of the countries around them. Baalim is a plural form of Baal, as we have already talked about. Now, Baal is a Phoenician word meaning God, just as El is a Canaanite word for God, and Allah is an Arabic word for God. It just means God. So, they turned to the worship of Belim and Ashtaroth, as they had before. So God sold them into the hand of the Philistines on the west coast, and then to the hand of the Ammonites in the east. And the Ammonites ruled over Gilead for 18 years, and they even crossed the Jordan and fought with Judah, Ephraim, and Benjamin. Ammon and Moab were the children of Lot, uh, when Lot was the nephew of Abraham, who came out of um, out of um, Mesopotamia with Abraham. And after the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot made children with his two daughters, and the one was named Moab, and the other one was named Ammon. And these nations are from those two children. Now, the Philistines were the people of Ambilek. If you remember Ambilek, uh, we spoke about him in episode 8. Uh, he was the king that uh, married Abraham and Sarah. And he was also the king that Isaac dealt with over the wells and all that. So that was the Philistines. They were, the Philistines and the Ammonites were ruling over them. And then the children of Israel began to call out to Yahweh for help. We have sinned against you. We have forsaken our God and served Baalim. God answered them and said, I delivered you from the Egyptians and the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Zidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites. You cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand, but you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Cry, go to the gods which you have chosen, 
Let them deliver you in your time of tribulation. The children of Israel said to Yahweh, We have sinned. Do what you want with us, only we pray deliver us this day. And they put away all the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. He felt sorry for them. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, while the children of Israel gathered together and encamped in Mizpah. So where is Mizpah? You see it there. It is in the territory of Benjamin, right on the north end of the territory of Benjamin. Mizpah became um, a great stronghold for the next period of Israel's his history. And the people and the princes of Gilead said, Whoever will begin to fight the, against the Ammonites will be the head over all of Gilead. In earlier years, the man who was named Gilead, so remember Gilead was named after a man who was named Gilead, and I guess he was named after the heap of testimony that Jacob and Laban made. So the man Gilead, he had a son named Jephthah, and this son was born from a prostitute. Gilead also had other sons and daughters from his wife. These were the Gileadites. When the Gileadites' sons grew up, they exiled Jephthah out from among them. They said, the son of a whore will not share the inheritance with us. Jephthah became a mighty man of valor in the land of Tob. Not sure where Tob is. It was probably east of Gilead in where the Ammonites were. And he also had a band of men with him who were vain men, or outcasts. Now when the men of Gilead were gathered in Mizpah and were oppressed by the Ammonites, they sent for Jephthah to come and help them to be their captain. Jephthah said to them, You hate me and have expelled me from my father's house. Why do you come to me now when you are in distress? He then made them swear before Yahweh that they would make him their leader if the Lord defeated the Ammonites through him. Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon. Why have you come to fight against us in our land? The king of Ammon answered, Because Israel took our land when they came out of Egypt from Arnon to Jabbok to the Jordan, return these lands to us peaceably. Now, Arnon to Jabbok are the two rivers. If you see the land of uh, Gad, okay, the Jabbok River is the river uh, between Manasseh and Gad that makes the border there. And the Arnon River is at the south end of the land of Reuben. That's the Arnon River. So he's saying the land from Jabbok to Arnon and to the Jordan, that is all our land, give it back. And Jephthah answered them, Israel did not take any land away from the people of Ammon or Moab. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, let us pass through your land but Edom refused. They also sent messengers to the king of Moab, but they also refused. They then went around the land of Edom and Moab on the east side and camped on the northern side of Arnon because the south side of Arnon was the land of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites in Heshbon, asking to let us pass through but Sion gathered his army and fought against Israel. The Lord God of Israel delivered the king of Heshbon and all his people, the Amorites, into the hand of Israel, and Israel possessed all of the land of the Amorites, from Arnon to Jabbok, and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before the people of Israel, and you think you should possess it? 
you can possess whatever your God Shemosh gives you, and Israel will possess whatever Yahweh, the God of Israel, gives to us. And now, are you any better than Balak, the king of Moab? Did he ever fight against Israel? Israel has dwelt in this land for 300 years. Why did you not take it back the land all that time? But the king of Ammon did not listen to Jephthah's reasoning. In Numbers chapter 31, I checked, and Moses drove the Midianites out east of the Jordan, not the Amorites. Now the Amorites were uh, called, uh, in Mesopotamia, they were called the Amaru. And all Canaanites became known as Amorites. So this is now 300 years later, and this king of Ammon is uh, confused about the history. He doesn't have the right history. And um, the Midianites are not Canaanites. They were sons of Abraham through Keturah. So the Midianites were in that land and they were driven out. Not the Ammonites and not the Amorites. If you remember Balak, the king of Moab, he hired the prophet Balaam to prophesy against Israel to try to stop them. He was using spiritual warfare against them. Uh, but Balaam, he was reproved by his donkey and he ended up blessing Israel instead of cursing them. Um, but Israel never did fight against the Moabites. <clears throat> So who is Shemosh? Shemosh was a deity of the Moabites and Ammonites. Not much is known about Shemosh. Uh, it is closely related to uh, the mother goddess Ishtar or Astarte. Also closely related to Moloch. For the greatest favor, human sacrifice was required by Shemosh. If we remember in uh, episode 15 when we talked about um, the Edomites um, when Jehoshaphat and Ahab I think uh, the king of Israel joined together to fight against the Ammonites or to fight against the Moabites and they went through Edom so the Edomites uh, Jews and Israelites all were allied against Moab and the king of Moab sacrificed his young son on the wall and the uh, Jews and the Edomites were disgusted because he was worshipping the same gods as the Israelites and that was Shemosh who he did that for. Now Jephthah was on dangerous ground here because he has put Shemosh on a level ground with Jehovah, with Yahweh. And that's kind of dangerous ground. Um, and he has entered into a spiritual warfare here with this king of Ammon and called upon, you know, let your God give to you whatever land your God has and let our God give to us whatever land our God has. Jephthah went and he left Mizpah and went across the Jordan and camped near the Ammonites. He then makes a vow to Yahweh. If you will deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then when I get home, Whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, I will offer it up in a sacrifice to you. He then went to battle, and it was a great victory. The children of Israel drove the Ammonites out of the land. When Jephthah got home to Mizpah, his daughter came out of the house dancing and singing to meet him. And she was his only child. Jephthah tore his clothes and said, You have brought me very low. 
You are one of them that trouble me. I have opened my mouth to the Lord and cannot go back. She then found out about what he had vowed, and she said to him, You must perform your vow, because the Lord has given you a great victory. Allow me two months to go up in the mountains and grieve my virginity, and I will come back. So he allowed her to go for two months, and she came back, and he sacrificed her to Yahweh. After that, it was a custom in Israel that every year the daughters went to mourn for the daughter of Jephthah for four days. After he sacrificed his daughter, the Ephraimites came to him and said, Why did you not call us when you went over to the Jordan to fight against the Ammonites? We will burn you and your house with fire. And Jephthah answered them, When we were oppressed by the Ammonites, and I called you then, you did not come to help us. I put my life in my hands and went against them, and Yahweh delivered them into my hand. So why are you coming here now to fight against me? Jephthah then gathered all the Gileadites and fought against the men of Ephraim, killing many because the Ephraimites said the Gileadites are fugitives among Ephraim and Manasseh. The Gileadites then took the passages across the Jordan, and anyone who escaped from the Ephraimites were caught, and if they denied being an Ephraimite, they were told to say Shibboleth, because the Ephraimites could not pronounce it correctly, and they killed them if they couldn't pronounce Shibboleth. At that time, 42,000 Ephraimites were killed. And Jephthah judged Israel for six years, and he died and was buried in Gilead. He had to sacrifice his daughter. Like, that was something that Shemosh would have demanded. So there's something going on there. I think it's because he put Shemosh on an equal footing with Yahweh over the land. And that was a huge mistake. And... Somehow, he, uh, he really stuck his foot in his mouth on that one. And it was a huge um, blunder. Okay, the next four chapters of the book of Judges are about Samson. Remember Samson, the strong man? Uh, when they cut his hair, he lost his strength. He had this girlfriend named Delilah. Uh, that... He is from the tribe of Dan, so we're not going to even talk about that. We're going to move ahead into the next um, Ephraimite that judged Israel. And his name was Micah. We read about him in Judges chapter 17. Micah was an Ephraimite. He lived on Mount Ephraim. When he was young, somebody stole 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother. That's about 27 pounds. His mother cursed the silver, and Micah heard it. Micah then confessed to his mother that he had stolen the silver. His mother then said, Blessed be you of Yahweh, my son. She then dedicated the silver to Yahweh for her son to make a graven image, and she gave all of the silver to her son. Micah then gave 200 shekels of silver to the founder who made a molten image, and Micah kept it in his house. And Micah had a house of gods, a, a little church full of idols, and he made an ephod and a teraphim. We have talked about ephods with Gideon earlier in this episode. A teraphim is a family idol, a guardian, a protector, a household deity. He also consecrated one of his sons to be a priest for his house of gods. In those days, there was no leader in Israel. Everyone did what they thought was right. There was a young man from the tribe of Judah, from the town of Bethlehem, who was a Levite. He had no place in Bethlehem, and he was on a journey to find his place. He came to Mount Ephraim, where he met Micah. Micah offered him ten shekels of silver a year, plus food and clothing, to be a father and a priest to his household. He agreed to that, and Micah, and Micah consecrated him to be a priest 
and Micah's son became like a son to him. And Micah said, Now I know Yahweh will do good to me, since I have a Levite for a priest. Now, if you look at the law of Moses regarding Levites, he's like way far off from following it at all. But he has a Levite priest. Now, Judges chapter 18 up to that time, the tribe, the tribe of Dan had still not received their entire inheritance. Joshua had divided up the land to the tribes, but Dan received too small of a portion. Israel was supposed to wipe out the Philistines. Uh, the book of Judges, chapter 13 to 16, talks about Samson, who was a leader and a warrior of the tribe of Dan, who frequently warred with the Philistines, but was taken down by Delilah. I suppose the Danites gave up on Palestine and decided to send out five chosen men to go find a new place for them to conquer. You see in the territory of Naphtali, way up north on the map, a town called Dan. That is the place they found. An undefended paradise full of lazy people that would be easy to conquer. On the way to find this place, the five men passed by the house of Micah, where they met the Levite priest who was in charge of Micah's little church. They asked him what he was doing there, and he explained that he was hired by Micah to be his priest. So they asked him to ask Yahweh which way they should go, that they would be prosperous. He told them, go in peace, whatever way you go will be prosperous. When the five men returned home, they told them of this place they found, this beautiful paradise which God has given to them and so easy to conquer. They sent 600 armed men to conquer it. The 600 men also passed by Micah's place. The five men who were with them went in and took the silver image and the ephod and the teraphim, and the Levite asked them, What are you doing? And they said, Come with us. Is it better for you to be a father of one man or a whole tribe of Israel? So the priest went with them, and his heart was glad. While they were on their way, Micah had gathered his neighbors for a troop, and he overtook them and said to them, You have taken my gods and my priests, so I have nothing left. They said to him, Be quiet while you still have your life and your family. So he turned back because they were too strong for him, and they came to the city called Laish, where the people were there undefended, and they killed them all and burned the city. They then built their own city there and called it Dan. And they set up the image they took from Micah. And a man named Jonathan, who was from the tribe of Manasseh, he and his family became their priests. And they were there until the captivity. The whole time the house of God was in Shiloh. The time seemed very bleak for Israel during the time of the judges. Now we will look at the last judge of Israel the prophet Samuel. This is an event leading up to the zenith of ancient Israel's power. Samuel was born somewhere between 1075 and 1100 BC. If we take a look at the timeline of history, it is interesting to note that these events take place after the collapse of power in all of the surrounding nations. The Hittite Empire has ended, the Kassite kingdom in Babylon has given way to a time of Assyrian and Elamite competition, and the new kingdom of Egypt has fallen to the Nubians. In our History of God channel, we will cover these historic periods when we come to them. Remember, channel-wise, we are still in the time of Jacob. So let's go back to understanding Ephraim and Manasseh. During the whole time of the judges, which we have just covered, the tent of meeting and the Levitical priesthood was active and working in Shiloh. Although Israel as a whole was in disarray and in an apparent series of failures, the Ark of the Covenant and the Levitical priesthood was constantly worshipping Yahweh and teaching the Torah in Shiloh. These next events take place in around Shiloh. So let's take a look.
starting in the first book of Samuel, chapter 1. There was a man of the tribe of Ephraim who lived near Shiloh. He had two wives. His name was Elkanah, and his two wives were named Hannah and Penina. Penina had several children, but Hannah had no children, like Leah and Rachel. When the family went to Shiloh every year, according to the statutes of the Lord, Hannah was derided there for not having children. She wept bitterly and made a vow to God. She said, O oh, Yahweh, if you will give me a man-child, I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now, this is uh, according to the law of Moses. This is a Nazarite law. Um, I'll just quickly read through this from Numbers chapter 6, starting in verse 1 to verse 5. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separates himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So that's a Nazarite. So she seems to be alluding to uh, no razor shall come upon his head. Samson was also a Nazarite of sorts. Uh, he was also vowed never to shave his head. And when his head was shaved, he lost his strength. So here Samuel is also uh, taking a vow of a Nazarite. So Hannah went home, and Yahweh answered her prayer, and she bore a man-child whom she called Samuel, which means heard by God. Because, as she said, I have asked for him from Yahweh. When the time of the year came for them to go to Shiloh, she told her husband, I will not go this year, but I will wait till the child is weaned, and then I will bring him to Shiloh and leave him there forever. Her husband allowed that, and when the time came the child was weaned, she brought him to Shiloh and lent him to the high priest for life. So Samuel was raised by Eli, the high priest. Eli had two other sons, whom the word of God calls sons of Belial. Um, now, Belial means worthlessness. Uh, during this time in the Bible, Belial seems to be nothing more than a word that is that just means worthlessness. They, they are leading a worthless life. Uh, they are evil. They, are, they only care about themselves. And, but during New Testament times, um, Belial seems to have taken on a new meaning. And Belial was another name for the devil. Eli had two other sons, who the word of God calls sons of Belial. They were also priests, but they abused their office and took a lot from the people who came to sacrifice before Yahweh, and they were abusive to the people. They were probably the ones bugging Hannah about not having a child. The sin of these two were very great because they caused the people to abhor the sacrifice, the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord as a child, and he wore a linen ephod. His mother made him a little coat and brought it to him each year when she, when she came to sacrifice. Samuel was well supported by his mother and his adopted father, Eli. 
And Eli blessed Hannah and her husband, saying, May Yahweh give you the seed of this woman according to the loan she has lent to Yahweh. She ended up bearing to her husband three more sons and two daughters. Eli, the high priest, was very old, and he heard what his two wicked sons had been doing. He warned them, If one man sins against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sins against Yahweh, who can help him? But they didn't listen to him, and they stayed on as priests, and they kept taking large portions from the sacrifices that people were bringing to God. A man of God came to Eli and said, Thus says Yahweh, Did I plainly appear to your father in Egypt in in Pharaoh's house, Moses? Did I not choose him of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? Now this was Moses' brother, Aaron. Did I give to the house of your father all the offerings made by fire from the children of Israel? But you kick at my sacrifice and offerings, and you honor your sons above me, and make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of my people Israel. Therefore the God of Israel says, I did say that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever, but now Yahweh says, Them that honor me I will honor, and those that despise me will be lightly esteemed. The days come that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, and there will not be an old man in your house. And you shall see an enemy in my habitation, in all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. And the man of yours who I will not cut off from my altar shall be to consume your eyes and grieve your heart and all the increase of your house shall die in its prime. And this shall be a sign to you, both of your sons shall die in one day. And I will raise up a faithful priest in me that will do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left from your house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, please, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. So Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Samuel was a young boy, and he was sleeping in the tent of meeting in Shiloh, with Eli the high priest sleeping close by. Eli was old and blind by this time. The lamp of God went out in the inner sanctuary, where the ark was, and Yahweh called to Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli, You called me, but Eli said, I didn't call you, go lay down. And Yahweh called Samuel again, and the third time. Then Eli realized it was Yahweh, and he told Samuel to say, Speak, Yahweh, for your servant hears. He did so, and Yahweh said, Behold, I will, I will do a great thing in Israel. I will perform all the things I have spoken against Eli and his house. I will be a beginning and an end, because his sons were vile, and he did not restrain them. Samuel lay awake the rest of the night, and he opened the doors of the tent of meeting, and he was afraid to tell Eli what Yahweh said to him. But Eli said, May it be done to you what he said if you don't tell me. So he told him everything, and Eli said, Let him do what seems good. Word got out that God appeared to Samuel in Shiloh, and soon all of Israel, from Dan to to Beersheba, so that's all the way from the most northern city, Dan, all the way down to Beersheba, the most southern city, And all the way from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a prophet of Yahweh. So chapter 4. And it came to pass that Israel went to battle against the Philistines. But Israel lost the battle, and 4,000 men were slain. The elders of Israel said, Why has God allowed this? 
Bring the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh, that it may save us. The two evil sons of Eli brought the Ark out to the battle, and all the camp of Israel shouted. The Philistines were afraid at first, because they knew the Ark of Yahweh, who smote the Egyptians with all the plagues. But they regained their stance and fought against Israel and won. The Philistines captured the Ark of Yahweh, and the two sons of Eli were killed in the battle. Eli was waiting by the path that led to Shiloh, because he was worried about the Ark. A man from Benjamin came and told him what had happened, that the Ark was captured and his two sons had died. When he heard about the ark, he fell off the rock he was sitting on, and he broke his neck and died. He was old and, and blind and overweight by then. He had judged Israel for forty years. Eli's daughter-in-law was pregnant, and near the time of birth, and when she heard about the ark and her father-in-law and her husband, she went into labor and died in childbirth. She named the child Ichabod, which means no glory, because she said the ark of God is taken, the glory is departed from Israel. The common thread here with Eli and his family is that they and their followers put all the glory in the ark itself and not in God. When the Philistines captured the ark, they brought it to one of their five capital cities, Ashdod. They had five kings with five capital cities, Ashdod, Gaza, Ascalon, Gath, and Ekron. They put the ark in the temple of their god, Dagon. Dagon is said to be half man, half fish god, but this is a form of him perpetuated in later times. He may have been given these attributes in Roman times by followers because the word Dagon being associated with the Canaanite word for fish. In ancient times, however, he seems to have been linked to war and agriculture. Dagon appears in the names of a few of the kings of the Isin dynasty of lower Mesopotamia, such as Ishmedagon and Idin Dagon. We talked about them in episode 9. Dagon was also invoked by Naram Sin of the Akkadian kingdom, and his name is invoked in the law code of Hammurabi as the subduer of settlements along the Euphrates. We spoke about these two Akkadian kings in episode 4. In Sumer, Dagon seems to be associated with Enlil, and in Canaan he is associated with El, or Baal. He was very high in the hierarchy of gods, number two or three, depending on the location. The Phoenicians referred to him in one inscription as Lord of Kings. Unfortunately, we have no accurate picture to show of Dagon. He has been mostly wiped from history at this point. So when the Philistines of Ashdod came to the temple of Dagon in the morning, the statue of Dagon was on the floor laying prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. And he, they set him back up again on his pedestal. The next morning they found Dagon on the ground again, and his head and his hands were cut off. Only the stump was left to him. And that is what we find in history also, only a stump. His hands were on the threshold of the temple, and the Philistines began a custom of not stepping on the threshold of Dagon's temple from that incident. Yahweh began to kill many of the people of Ashdod, and he gave them all hemorrhoids. The people of Ashdod then said, The hand of Yahweh is heavy upon us and upon Dagon. So they called the five kings of the Philistines together and asked them what to do. They said, Bring the ark of Yahweh to Gath, and they did so. Yahweh then did the same to Gath as he did to Ashdod. So they took the ark to Ekron. The Ekronites rose in an outcry against the ark coming to their city, and they also were dying of the hemorrhoids or large tumors on their private parts. So they called the five kings and demanded the ark be taken away. The five kings called the diviners and priests and asked them what to do. 
The Ark had been captured for seven months by this time. They said make five golden hemorrhoids and five golden mice to represent the five kings and make a new cart with two cattle that have never been yoked and put the Ark and the golden offerings on the cart as a trespass offering and humble yourselves before Yahweh and let it go. If it goes towards Israel, then you know Yahweh has done this to us. But if it goes the other way, then you know it all happened by chance. Then they did so, and the cart went towards Israel. They followed it all the way to the border. When the ark came to the border to the city founded by Joshua, the people were in the fields harvesting with the wheat, and they saw the ark returning on the cart, and they rejoiced. The Levites of the town broke the cart in pieces and offered the cows as an offering to Yahweh. When the five kings of the Philistines saw this, they returned home. And God killed the people of the town who had looked at the ark, 50,000 of them, because they knew where they were not to look at the ark. He held Israel to a higher standard than the Philistines. They sent messengers to the Levites to come and get the ark. They brought it to the place on the border of Judah and Benjamin in the house of a man named Eleazar, where it stayed for twenty years. And all the house of Israel mourned because the ark was still not in Shiloh after twenty years. And Samuel spoke to the house of Israel and he told them to get rid of Baalim and Ashtaroth from among them and turn wholly to Yahweh. We already discussed Baalim and Ashtaroth. These were the deities popular among the Canaanites and Israel since the time of Joshua. <clears throat> Samuel said to gather everyone at Mizpah and I will pray for you. They gathered there and poured out pure water before the Lord and fasted and confessed their error of worshipping false gods. And Samuel became the judge of Israel that day. The Philistines heard that Israel was gathered in Mizpah, so the five kings came out to battle against them. The Israelites asked Samuel to pray for them and to save them from the Philistines. Samuel offered a lamb to Yahweh, and the Philistines came near, but Yahweh thundered with a great thunder upon them. And they were put into disarray, and the men of Israel came upon them, and were victorious, and killed many as they pursued them as far as Bethkar. Samuel then set up a stone between Mizpah and Shen, and called it Ebenezer, Stone of the Help, saying, Up to here Yahweh has helped us. The Philistines didn't cross Israel's border anymore during the days of Samuel, and they were subdued before Yahweh. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, Ekron and Gath, and all the way to the coast. And the Amorites, or the Amaru, as they were called by the Akkadians and the Sumerians, they were at peace with Israel. Samuel built an altar at Ramah where he lived and he did a yearly circuit from there to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah to judge Israel. And at this point I th we're going to end part 3 and the story of Samuel will continue into part 4 but this is where a major change takes place for Israel. Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing.